So let's go ahead and let you know uh, who you're going to hear from. You're going to be hearing from Ella Costin, Aaron Much, and Kate Carlson. And I'll introduce a little bit more about them uh, before each of their uh, presentations. But before we get to that, I just want to go over some logistics. This being the first uh, user presentation of the um, of the Ed Summit. So first of all, I think you know already that the meeting is being recorded, and you'll be able to access the recordings, um, at, you know, in a in a later date, and that will be announced when those recordings are available. Um, we do want you to participate, so please share your questions in the Q and A, and we'll get to as many as we can during the at the end of the session. And that's when we'll really get to answering questions is after all three presenters have finished. And I'll moderate that. All right, so with that, I would like to go into our uh, first presentation. Okay. So our first presentation is called From the Classroom to a Virtual Real World COVID-19, uh, to a Virtual Real World COVID-19 Changed Our GIS Fellowship. And this is from Ella Kasten. So Ella is a fellow at the William and Mary Center for Geospatial Analysis. She provides academic research and community GIS support. And she'll be sharing how the scope of her role changed dramatically due to the pandemic and how that also created some new opportunities for GIS outreach, professional development, and online learning and teaching. And so Ella, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And whenever you are ready, you can begin uh, to share yours. All right. Get everyone situated so I can see my screen. Um, yes, we are seeing it. So we that's are seeing terrific. my screen. Yeah, Great. It's always a big relief. <laughs> all right. Thing. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be presenting for you all about how working in GIS during COVID um, changed. I was supposed to have a co-presenter, my co-fellow, Olivia Spencer, during this presentation, but she is currently hung up and having technical difficulties. So she may pop in in a few minutes, and if so, she'll join me presenting, but if not, it'll just be me for today. Um, so to get started, I'll give you a little bit of my background. So I majored in biology and environmental design um, at William & Mary, um, and I got into GIS because I wanted to use GIS to mitigate the effects of the climate crisis, as well as use it as a tool to study how the built environment and design interact. Um, and tying into that, I also got into remote sensing, cartography, um, and of course, using story maps. Um, Olivia, similar background, she also was a bio and she wanted to use uh, geospatial technologies for climate change, cartography, GIS, and human environment um, interactions. Um, as far as my GIS journey, I actually got into the GIS field pretty late in my college career. I took the first GIS class the fall of my senior year um, and was instantly hooked. Um, that next semester, I went ahead and signed up for a geovisualization course, conservation GIS, and remote sensing. Um, and I really haven't looked back since. Um, put that in context, this semester where I really got into GIS was also the spring of 2020. Um, where we had to pivot from in-person learning to remote learning um, due to COVID. Um, and for me, what really keeps me hooked on GIS is the interdisciplinary nature and how you can kind of apply it to any project. And it's just a great tool to have in your toolbox. So what is the CGA Fellowship? Um, this William & Mary Center for Geospatial Analysis sponsors a one-year postdoc position um, to transition William & Mary students with an interest in GIS into the professional world. Um, so typically during this fellowship, um, fellows develop their personal geospatial skills as well as being the point of contact to support students as well as assist faculty, um, staff, and other external partners with their research. Um, as you can see from these photos, um, there's some photos from previous fellows sitting very close to each other without masks. Um, and then um, in the bottom left, there's Olivia and I standing far apart and masked, which was kind of the theme for most of our fellowship. Um, we did get to work in person, which was really exciting, but we were masked and socially distant for that whole time. So going into this fellowship, we got hired right um, as we graduated, so May of 2020. Um, 
And when we applied, we expected to be in person, helping students, um, doing research consultations. It's also the job of the fellows to teach the GPS lab for the intro GIS class. So that's going into the classroom, um, meeting students, and then taking them out around campus and showing them how to use the GPS units. Um, we also are expected to organize um, some in-person events, so celebrating GIS Day, as I'm sure you all are aware, as well as a spring geospatial research symposium to highlight all of the GIS work being done on the William & Mary campus. Um, on top of that, we promote the use of GIS on campus, so maybe going into classes and doing story map demos or helping a class learn how to make a simple map for a project. Um, and the overall uh, main task of a fellow is to be the faces of the CGA. So we sit there, we greet people, people come in and ask questions, and we're the ones there to help um, in the lab and answer students' questions and help them when they need assistance. But due to COVID, um, all of those expectations kind of um, went out the window. So we did a lot of um, assistance via Zoom. So we would screen share and take over their screen and show them where to navigate to, um, which was very difficult. Um, um, we also were able to do some in-person help, but we had to you know, maintain six feet and wipe down keyboards and like move away from each other when working um, next to them. So that was difficult to carry out. All of our event planning switched to virtual. Um, at first we were a little bummed about that, but we were able to use story maps and web apps as well as some survey one, two, threes to create um, virtual ways for students to interact. Um, and we actually reached a wider audience than we typically do um, on our GIS day, just because we were able to send it out across our listserv and post it on campus um, wide listservs um, to get a wider GIS uh, group. Um, we also did a lot of GIS um, for COVID. So we used GIS to determine the social distancing capacity of outdoor spaces, which I will talk about more later. Um, we did some story map demos, and we also made a map to share the gratitude of getting through a COVID semester. Um, though we were open um, in person, um, we still had to follow strict COVID guidelines, which was not um, what we were used to in the CGA. Um, we had to use an online booking system for our computer lab, um, and we all became really well acquainted with Zoom and Zoom meetings and providing technical assistance on Zoom. Um, so I'm going to get into some of the projects we worked on. So typically um, in July when fellows are getting onboarded, you know, you're learning how to check your email, how to um, navigate your new admin privileges in ArcGIS Online, um, how to provide assistance. Um, Olivia and I were sent out immediately um, with some general ideas of where William & Mary wanted to place outdoor tents um, for um, outdoor learning. Um, and we were told to map where the tents would go as well as um, calculate the capacity um, that could safely sit under these tents. Um, so this was like our second week on the job. We were out ground truthing and figuring out where um, we could place these tents. Um, and there's a photo of us in the bottom right with one of our tents that we placed. Um, a big theme of our fellowship was story maps. Um, I don't know if you all have seen this, but story maps are the best thing that happened in virtual learning. Everyone loves story maps. Um, we calculated that between Olivia and I, we reached 236 individuals with story maps. Um, this was a wide variety of classes from English classes, to science classes, to sociology classes, um, and using story maps as a way to creatively share information in a virtual education setting. Um, we also developed some partnerships. So we started working on story map, making story maps for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, as well as the Virginia Foundation for Healthy, Healthy Youth. Um, and then we also had our virtual GIS day, which we made a story map for, so people could be navigated through um, a celebration um, at their own speed. Uh, and then we also tied into GIS day a story map competition, where students could create their own story maps and share them um, with us. And then we gave them some prizes. Because we had such a successful um, fall semester at William & Mary, we wanted a way to share everyone's gratitude. So we made this map called Mappy Thanksgiving. Um, it's just a survey one, two, three, where individuals can submit um, a location and then thank someone who made their semester possible. 
Um, so this was a really great way to wrap up a very chaotic, very um, unusual semester and just reflect back on what we were thankful for and how all the individuals who made um, the semester possible. You'll notice in the map, there's two different colored points. Um, so the green ones, we went around and just thanked every building. So the science building says, um, thank you, science department for um, a successful semester and so forth. And then all of the yellow ones are ones that were submitted um, by individuals. And it was very nice to read through um, and very heartwarming. And so that was a great project that we worked on. Um, so some challenges we faced, um, obviously it was not the job we applied for and expected, um, but learning to adapt and troubleshoot is essential to GIS. Um, kind of the phrase we kept throughout our semester or fellowship was keep our knees bent. And I think that's just a great um, motto for working with GIS is always being ready to solve problems and um, tackle different challenges. Um, obviously providing technical assistance from six feet apart is surprisingly difficult. Um, virtual desktops are less than ideal, especially when you're running GIS um, or Pro. Um, and nothing is certain, but flexibility is important in all fields, especially in GIS. However, there's some great benefits of a virtual world. Um, we got to attend a ton of conferences virtually. Um, we attended the Esri User Conference um, back in July, um, NASIS, and we presented at NEARC. Um, obviously, I'm here presenting now, which is something I probably would not have been able to do um, if it was in person. Um, it's also allowed us to tap into the large variety of GIS resources online and really appreciate um, all the things that you can access virtually and learn from. Um, as well as creating virtual resources for students that they can look back on. We made a lot of how-to videos um, that would typically have just been taught in a classroom um, and can be used over and over again. And then we also were just able to reach such a wider range of students near and far on campus and completed their semesters virtually um, because of that. Um, I know we're saving questions for the end, so um, you can do that. But if you have any questions, email cga at wm.edu. You can check out our website social media, Twitter, Instagram. We also have a LinkedIn. And then I would just like to say a very special thanks to Dr. Shannon White, um, our, the interim director of the CGA and our boss during our fellowship um, and for everything she did for us um, during this time. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That's really interesting. I have questions, but I have to, um, you know, follow my own instructions and wait until the end. So, um, but uh, that was uh, entertaining and interesting. And I'm glad that you've had that experience. Um, so, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we are going to go to our next presentation, but we'll come back for questions at the end. All right. And so let me, I can once again, share my slide just for introductions. Okay. All right, and so our second presenter is Erin Much, and her presentation is Removing Barriers to Access GIS Technology for Students, Staff, and Faculty. Erin is the founding manager of the Spatial Analysis and Research Center, or SPARC, isn't that a great acronym, at the University of California, Merced. SPARC is now the GIS Center, which is part of the new initiative at the University Library, which will co-locate data science services and GIS into a faculty research hub. Erin has a master's degree in GIS from Penn State. And before working for, the UC, for UC Merced, she has worked as a GIS consultant and had her own business from 2006 to 2013. Erin will describe enabling easier access to ArcGIS result, how enabling easier access to ArcGIS resulted in drastic increases in the number of users taking advantage of their license agreement and how this increase use is tracked and supported. So Erin, I'm going to stop sharing my screen Thank and you. turn it over to you. Thank you. And yes, SPARC is such a great acronym that um, we had to change it because SPARC is also our freshman seminar series. So all incoming freshmen are required to take SPARC seminars. And we ran into a lot of um, confusion because freshmen would come to me asking me about uh, support for these seminars that 
uh, we're in a different space. So anyway, um, we just simplified. We are the GIS uh, and Data Science Center. We're rebranding. We'll see how that goes. But thank you so much for having me today. And I will be cognizant of the time because 10 minutes is not a lot of time, as you probably um, are aware. So our goal, the, the, the presentation today is about removing barriers to access. I will also be presenting in tomorrow's session with Peter Noop, and I'll be going more into initiating single sign-on and um, more of those details. So whatever I don't cover today, I will surely cover tomorrow in detail. So I don't want to overlap. But um, yes, I'm with the University of California Merced. Um, as a, just a quick introduction, as Mark already uh, introduced me, this is just enough information. I really, uh, when I started in the private sector, my goal was to work in academia. And I started um, working on that goal um, since 2005 and kind of gave up in 2012 that I'm never gonna get a job in academia and this position came up. So it was really um, fortunate. Our center was originally within um, the Office of Research because they expected us to get a bunch of grant money and to bring in all you know, millions of dollars of funding. And that was just not tenable. And so we were able to move into the university library, which is a better ecosystem. So just to get a picture of where UC Merced is for us geographers, we are in the heart of California. So we are about two hours from San Francisco, two hours from Yosemite National Park. Um, we are in a location that is greatly underserved. And we also have this brand new campus. It's, uh, as many say, it's in the middle of nowhere. This is good a perspective that it is in the middle of nowhere. But on the right side is our brand new 2020 project buildings that have yet to be um, utilized to its fullest, but we expect to, we're planning on fully reopening this fall. So we were closed. Um, for the most all, part all year. Oh, I also wanted to quickly mention that we were given a surprise uh, donation from Mackenzie Scott uh, of $20 million, which is our largest endowment um, ever. We are a new university. We opened in 2005. So again, I try to get more into the history of our university as part of the use. We are part of the University of California system, but we are the brand new campus. So the um, endowment is, um, we're excited about that. This is a campus-wide endowment. We're the only University of California that received it. And um, I can share more information on that at the end if people are interested. So the biggest issue when I came on campus was trying to remove barriers to GIS. So one of the approaches was to implement single sign-on. I sat on sessions like this, I learned from others, I sat down and met and said, okay, how, what are the best, best practices? So single sign on, um, in my opinion, is a best practice so that helped remove our barriers. We also removed our recharge for software purchases. So I, when I came to campus, I became a bill collector. I did not, I left consulting, so I didn't have to send invoices and collect bills. I just wanted to support education. We also, part of our removal varies, we offered free information sessions, guest lectures and classes. So I will target faculty teaching with GIS and say, hey, I'll let me talk to you guys and help you out. And then we also designed a start page at our, um, intro, in our UC Merced maps, arcgis.com, our entry point to access information. So the barrier number one, of going into these details that desktop was fee-based. So again, the rationale that I was given was, well, if if they're using it for grants, they should pay for it. Well, yeah, but it, it cost about triple um, to process these recharges than just to give it out for free. And it also created a big barrier between our center and the faculty. So I'd be chasing, you know, account numbers, trying to process invoices, then faculty would go to other faculty and they say, well, why are you charging us $100? And they'll bootleg licenses and they'll get stuff from other organizations. So it really prevented us from supporting the technology for research and learning because it was like, you can't talk to Erin and, and unless she's gonna have her hand out and try to collect money. The second barrier was ArcGIS online account setup. 
So we did set up accounts, but we had to do them manually. And we struggled with a lot of students forgetting their passwords and um, also user management. We had to kind of brute force the roles and the groups. And as many are familiar with, credit allocation used to be a challenge. It's no longer a challenge because there's plenty of credits now. But before it was like, oh, someone's going to do something and geocode a million addresses and just kill all our credits. Barrier number three was, again, the learning of resources. We do not have a GIS or geography program. We do have a new minor that either is approved or under development, or also we have programs in data science that are under development, which is kind of why we are, we are joining forces with data science within the library to provide these um, support services. Our new faculty and lab directors also expected students to have GIS skills. So because we're a University of California, and a lot of um, professors came from UC Davis or Berkeley or other organizations that had GIS classes, they would teach and expect these students to have these skills. And these students would just be handcuffed and, and panicking. So that was a big barrier. So then I worked very hard to help bridge those gaps. So nothing is really free, of course. Um, so with this free distribution of, of software, we do have an expectation and agreement that st students, faculty, staff are expected to install their own software and handle basic technical issues. Advanced support will be fee-based. So if I have to go in and really take care of something that exceeds four hours, I have to say, okay, you've reached your limit of free service. I have to provide, I have to, um, I have to charge you. Uh, a lot of our expected pitfalls when we opened it up is that we would have more tech support issues than we can handle. Then it was like, how are we going to keep up with all these new apps? Again, I only, it's only myself and a part-time person running the GIS for a campus of 9,000 students. Another pitfall was that leadership's going to say, oh, why are you giving this away? Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. So it's kind of, luckily, we were able to dodge the bureaucracy and, and justify that it was, we were able to um, get through that. So our outcomes are our legacy users didn't lose their access to older software. So those who are kind of in the older system, we said, we support you. Here's your concurrent license. Go to town, install them on labs, install them on your servers. It's all good. When we implemented single sign-on in September 2019, we saw a 400% increase in users. And we did not really advertise it. We just kind of said, this is how you do it. Here's some documentation which allowed us to work on more focused GIS research projects. So we actually brought in more income by doing GIS research than chasing around the $100 per license issue. And then um, when COVID hit, ArcGIS Online saw a spike in use because it was used as a teaching tool when we shifted to distance learning. So this is an example of my dashboard and I can put these links in the chat at the end of, um, this is up to date of June 1st. So we have a breakdown of our users. We have over a thousand users and most of them are active. It's, this isn't fake numbers. This, this is legitimate increase from again, 200 users in September, 2019 to now what we have here. We broke it down by major. Again, this was insp inspired by Peter Noop and Esri to look at um, how things are distributed. So September, 2019, I should highlight that's the biggest bar a lot of these spikes in users were automated, you know, spreadsheets where we added it for a group or added it for a workshop. But we have a pretty steady growth at this point in um, our user base. We also wanted to analyze our ArcGIS Pro users, which is another dashboard I can send a link to. That again, helps us understand kind of who's using it and how they're using it and what department so we can target our, our resources. So our biggest users are really in engineering for ArcGIS Pro. And the previous dashboard shows that our social sciences group are more um, ArcGIS online. Breakdown of the users per um, undergraduate, so seniors, basically. We also wanted to look at our ArcMap users and see kind of the breakdown, because those are what we call our legacy uh, old school users. But we do have new faculty that only know ArcMap. So we do issue licenses for them. And so we looked at the affiliation of who uses it. The major groups are faculty and graduate students. So undergraduates 
are really a small portion of who uses ArcMap. And that's by design. We don't promote ArcMap for undergraduates unless they're required to do that for their research. We're not gatekeeping, but we're also saying, look, just go to pro and let the faculty and grad students who were trained on it 10 years ago continue to work in the ArcMap environment if they choose. Uh, we do a lot of outreach and affiliations, no time to go through that, but that's kind of how we keep on top of this. Um, our user base grew um, because we had documentation, because we had, um, we still issue licenses for free for ArcMap. We have how-to guides. We, we encourage ArcGIS Online for faculty. So we say, look, just start with ArcGIS Online. If you go into Pro, we'll support you, but just start here first. You, you can't get to this until you get to that. We also leverage the free training resources. We also have right now about two, 713 active story maps. Many of them have over a thousand views. So story maps have been an excellent platform for our researchers. Uh, this is one great example, and I'll put the link in the chat for to look at later. It's an excellent story map about gentrification project that's been worked on by one of our researchers in DC and um, her research is getting published as many other researchers and faculty are getting their um, research published because they're now able to use these tools um, without the barriers. And another cool map of some drone imagery looking at squirrel boreholes on a farm. So, you know, we go from, you know, different scales of support, but our drone um, program is really blossoming. So we're, we're um, supporting a lot of detailed type of mapping. So moving forward, we need to reconnect with our um, faculty and students uh, live, hopefully. So we we do we have some of seen a drop a little bit because I think with COVID and not being on campus, people are burned out by Zoom and by having to do all of this. And we are going to promote our recent projects from our faculty and research labs, and we'll promote our own projects too. We do want to recognize our undergraduate researchers too and give them credit for pushing through and uh, creating a lot of great projects. Uh, we work hard to share current internships and jobs in GIS field, and then we wanna create GIS hubs for data sharing and discovery. So uh, again, I'll put these links, uh, I guess, in the chat in um, as far as the dashboards, if you wanna look at how we did that. I just wanna acknowledge, and there's more to acknowledge, but um, Angela and uh, Rita uh, Esri, Peter Noop for inspiring the dashboards. Amy and Carlos at the UC, we work together, the University of California work close together, and then our team. Uh, these dashboards were created by not uh, my halftime person, but a student. So my student this year, uh, her project was to build these dashboards. So thank you. I ran over time a little bit. I apologize for that, um, but I look forward to listening, um, answering any questions every time at the end. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, thank you, Aaron. And I did put the um, uh, link to that first dashboard that you showed um, into the chat window, if anyone wants to see that. And what a terrific kind of testimony that is, you know, for um, you know, increasing usage, increasing access across the campus. And not just because you can do it, but because it really is a value, you know, throughout the campus. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead to our final presentation. Okay. And so our final presentation is with Kate Carlson from the University of Minnesota, and it's creating sustainable support for story maps in the classroom. And you'll see a theme here so far in, in our two uh, earlier presentations. They weren't specifically about story maps, but both uh, showed how story maps could be a valuable tool. So Kate's going to share a little bit more experience along those lines. Kate Carlson is a spatial technology consultant at U-Spatial, a University of Minnesota center that supports spatial research. She has considerable experience in higher education as faculty and a research associate, leading students through geospatial curriculum in the class and abroad. She finds great inspiration in teaching others how to make maps, including story maps. Her presentation will discuss the use of story maps as a learning tool at the University of Minnesota and how they are planning to better support this increasingly popular format. And so Kate, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so you can 
share your presentation. We're looking forward to it. All right, thank you, Mark, for the introduction and um, for having me in this session. It was really great to listen to the two um, presenters before. Um, there's a lot of common themes and things that, that we've worked through as well. So it's really great to hear about how other institutions are, are handling this kind of support. Um, so I'm Kate Carlson, and I, so you've already heard a little bit about Youth Spatial. Um, at the University of Minnesota, we have a center on campus that's part of the Research Computer, uh, excuse me, Research Computing Group, uh, which is a center through the Office of the Vice President for Research. So one of the primary objectives of, of Youth Spatial is to support spatially related research and teaching on campus. And, and it's really great because our, our vice president, well, he, he just left. <laughs> We're in the, in the interim right now. But one of his philosophies is that teaching is research, you know. And so when we go into classrooms and teach students how to use these spatial tools, um, they'll, they'll take it for, uh, further outside of their curriculum and use it in their research. And we see more and more of that. So for part of our objective is, is really just trying to help the campus understand what kind of tools do they have available to them, um, how can they use them? How can you bring them into the classroom? And how can you use them to support your research? And a part of that is the, the support that we give for Story Map specifically. But of course, we, we support many other uh, factors in using GIS and, and um, tools like that um, across many different purposes at the campus. So just a little overview on on what our organization looks like. Uh, we've had an org for quite a while. Um, I'm not really sure when it started, maybe 2012, somewhere in that time. Um, but since, since the inception of that organizational account, our ArcGIS Online, um, we have over 15,000 users. I just checked last night and we, we've gone over, we're almost to 16,000 uh, named users. Now, some of those users are not no longer active they have since departed, they've graduated, they've taken other faculty positions. Um, but, but many students, many staff and many faculty have been reached with these tools. And I, I think that really says a lot about um, how we've been able to really engage the campus communities. At the University of Minnesota, we have five campuses. Um, and on every campus, um, students, faculty and staff are using these resources in some way or another. It may just be a story map and it may be very high end uh, geospatial computing. And as far as our collegiate units go, it's very multidisciplinary. And I, I saw that too in Ella and Aaron's presentations. They, they work with a lot of different departments. Um, so just taking some data that we pulled down last April, um, you can see some of our heavy hitters are, are in the liberal arts, where our geography, GIS programs are. Uh, we've reached into a lot of humanities classrooms, history, anthropology, um, science, food and agriculture, nursing, the medical school, the, the school of design. It's so multidisciplinary and there's so many different reasons on how and why people want to use maps, whether it's in the classroom or for their research, uh, we can find a way to do that. Um, so it's really exciting to see how these tools have been leveraged across these, these uh, campus colleges and the campuses. Now, just with our small uh, story map support group, um, there's four of us that are actively in the group right now, um, and we come from multiple areas. Use Spatial for myself, uh, the University of Minnesota Libraries, um, and academic technologists from uh, the College of Liberal Arts. So we work together in, in trying to help faculty use these tools. And I completely agree with Ella when she said, um, earlier that story maps are the best thing that happened to a virtual teaching environment. Um, it really, uh, we got a lot of interest from new faculty who were teaching completely online who wanted to use some of these multimedia resource tools um, for their teaching and for student learning. Um, so that, that was really encouraging. Um, and these are just a few examples of the different disciplines that we've worked with. Um, I noted the pandemic semesters here because we had a little bit of a decrease. We're really on this, on this heavy e increase in how many students that we were able to reach. Um, but even in this past spring semester and the fall, we reached you know, over 550 
uh, people or nearly 600 last fall. So not people, I should say students specifically. And that's just with who our group is working with. There are other faculty out there who are leveraging these tools on their own, or we helped them a few years ago and they are completely um, um, able to, to instruct with them. They, they've gotten over that hurdle of learning how, how to do that. Um, so our group, we spend a lot of time with uh, in consultation, in the classroom, providing tech support, creating groups, wrangling data, you know, depending on what kind of, of, um, of curriculum that they want to implement. We spend a lot of time. So we're trying to figure out a way to really uh, reduce this number of hours or consolidate our consultation um, and tech support uh, primarily. So really kind of looking back in the last three years, one of the things that we've been able to do is create this hub site. And um, I hope that some of you um, have found this and if you found it helpful, we do have a feedback form on there. If you have any uh, further suggestions or any links that we might be missing, we do our best to keep it up. But we, we certainly have found that it's been a good resource for our faculty here at the University of Minnesota, um, at least to come in and find some gallery examples of what students are capable of doing. Um, what different kinds of assignments would allow them to create the kind of story maps that, that an instructor might be looking for them to achieve. Um, some instructional resources on, 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 on uh, assignment building. And then we do have some student resources as well, you know, how to get, um, or some helpful tips on building web maps, um, some useful resources information on the new story map builder. And um, so this, this, this hub site is, is something that, that we built uh, hoping to kind of leverage some of that time that, or try to trim back some of that time that we spend with those faculty members. Uh, the next thing that we plan to implement is a, a, a spotlight series. And we've opened it up to the public. Uh, we had one in April that had many people from other institutions. So we'd really love to see other people uh, join us in on this conversation. Uh, but the, the Story Map Spotlight series will spotlight certain types of uses of story maps or ArcGIS Online in the classroom. So the first one we had in April was about using Survey123 to create collaborative data creation projects for students to explore. So we had a professor, uh, a graduate, um, or excuse me, a PhD student, Chris Allen, who was who used to be on our, our story maps team, um, he presented and then um, faculty from foreign languages, a Spanish uh, class. Um, you could view the presentation. I will share this, this um, story map uh, as soon as I'm done presenting. Um, but you can view that presentation here. Uh, coming up, future spotlights, we're going to spotlight how the University of Minnesota libraries are leveraging story maps for sharing archive collections. Uh, the, law, the law library, as well as the Wagenstein Library, which is the uh, medical history library, are using story maps judiciously to show some of these archived um, document, documents and, and, and so on. Uh, coming up too, we want to look at different class collections, um, how faculty are using individual story maps, pulling them into a collection or you know, collaboration among students. Um, other kinds of projects, collaborations with community engagement. Um, and then other types of student exhibits. Students have been working on classroom projects that are used as exhibits in the Bell Museum of Natural History at the University of Minnesota. So, so we really want to use these spotlights to pull people together and kind of create a community of faculty who are have similar objectives and goals and how they might start uh, talking to one another and kind of uh, feeding off of each other's ideas and maybe become um, uh, and, you know, engaged in, in some other way that they maybe didn't think that they could. So we'll have a few more of those spotlights coming up this fall. Um, another thing I wanted to mention too, and this is aside from our story maps team, is that Use Spatial, we offer trainings and we, I have seen an uptick in graduate students who are teaching assistants, um, as well as faculty, especially coming to take our story maps 101. Uh, just, this is really, it's a two hour workshop. We've been offering it virtually for free um, to come in and learn uh, just how does a builder work? Why would I use story maps? What, how can they tell a story differently than writing a paper? 
And also through Use Spatial, we have the what's, what's called the Use Spatial Mapping Prize. And this is really just to, it's to encourage students to show off their work and to really be proud of it and, and to generate something to win an award and, and you can add it to your, to your resume and to your portfolio of work um, and to be acknowledged for some of the things that you worked on in your class or worked in, in your personal research. Uh, so we do offer monetary uh, awards for that and it provides an incentive to students. Um, and if you want to take a look, we do have the 2021 best overall map. These results just came out uh, last week. Um, and in the interest of time, I, I want to make sure to leave time for some for some questions here. Um, just a couple of last things to mention about what we're working on to get the word out on, on story maps and ArcGIS Online and spatial thinking in general um, is that we started with, um, we created a badge and the badge uh, requirements are completing two use spatial workshops and then submitting an assessment. It could be a completed story map or a reflective essay that describes how does how do these tools um, benefit your future career path? How does it benefit your research? What is it about these tools that that um, that can help you in the future? So um, so right now we have about sixty people going through this process at some you know at some level, and it's really exciting to see to see that uh, this particular badging. Uh, shut off the shores, um, along with several other types of badges that are being issued through the graduate school. But I will stop there. Um, just know that I, we do have some offboarding materials um, that, that we share with students. So as their impending uh, graduation comes, what do they do with their ArcGIS online content? So if you're interested in, in any of this or have any interest in collaborating or have additional ideas, um, I'd always love to hear from you. Um, but thank you very much, and I'll stop there, Mark. Okay, Kate, that's terrific. Yeah, you know that that mapping competition with like real prizes, like a thousand bucks, is a pretty good first prize. And the uh, the badging, I mean, that's really innovative. I love to see that. I'm going to share my screen, you guys. We do have a couple of minutes um, for questions. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and while you're thinking of your questions or maybe typing those into the Q&A panel, uh, just also make sure that you do fill out uh, the evaluation for the, the workshop. And so there's a link there in the, that I'm sharing, you know, in which I'm sharing my screen. There's also a QR code and you can hold up your phone if you want to and take a picture of that or, you know, do whatever my kids do when they see those things. Uh, so, um, and, and if you need a certificate of attendance, there's also an email address that you can um, uh, email and request a certificate. We'll send that to you, okay? Zach also put in the link to the evaluation, okay? And uh, Becky asked Kate if she could share the link to the Story Maps hub site, and that would be terrific. I'm sure she's looking right into that. Um, and so, uh, you know, we do have just a couple of minutes and, and I was thinking of questions myself as I uh, um, was listening to uh, all of the presenters, but, you know, starting, Ella, if, if you were there, you know, is your experience with your fellowship changed drastically from what was intended? Um, but I was just wondering if, um, if now in retrospect with what you were kind of forced, how you were forced to pivot if you would change it now that, you know, or do you think it actually ended up being um, more beneficial? Um, I definitely wouldn't change anything about my fellowship. It was a great year and it definitely pushed me to problem solve and think more creatively in how I used my GIS skills and how I went about helping others. And I think it was a great, great experience as like a first job out of college. Um, to kind of just learn that things don't always go as they seem and that things are going to change on a whim and you just have to go with it. Um, well, so, yeah, um, I think starting out, I was a little disappointed that things weren't going to be the same, but looking back on it, I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, it's, you know, and I realize it's sort of a hypothetical question because it's just what you had to deal with, but that's the way it seemed to me too, that, you know, it, it actually gave you a better experience uh, and it's nice when things work out that way, because that is those, I think anybody on the, uh, in the presentation would 
agree that um, that's life, you know, in the regular GIS professional workspace is the ability to adapt to those kinds of changes. Um, I have other questions as well, so, but it looks like we are at the um, outer edge of our time limit, which is, uh, I regret. So, hey, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, th those were not just inspiring stories, but they were uh, practical uh, and helpful stories. I hope that, um, you know, you will look at the example of um, Aaron at UC Merced in making GIS accept, accessible throughout the campus and at the example of Kate in University of Minnesota as well in coming up with ways to, um, uh, uh, you know, recognize and add value, you know, um, uh, and support GIS users throughout the campus. Um, there's some great stuff there. Uh, so reach out to them if you have questions and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.